Welcome to episode 6 of Mike's Moment Of. I want to do a quick check-in with everybody listening and I hope that everybody's being safe and washing their hands and sanitizing when you can't. You know, keeping your hands off your face. Doing what's required to limit the spread of the coronavirus. Coronavirus! Coronavirus! <laughs> At least some people are finding things to laugh about. You know, which is important as well. I mean, how how is the quarantine? I have to confess, I'm loving it. <laughs> I awake each day with a guilty thrill that I do not have to go out and engage. It's the introvert in me, I guess. I'd mean, love to hear from you. Drop your reviews on your favorite podcast app. Leave a rating, share, but you can also email your comments to mikesmomentof at gmail.com. Right? I want to share a few reviews. This one is from Jamaica. And the person is called Jabukem Music. And they give five stars and they go awesome. This is about the interview with Peter Ashburn. That was last episode. Another one from Instagram. Uh, from Michael Andrade one and he says great podcast keep it up thank you so much Mike thanks a lot and then there's another review this one's from the US on iTunes and it's from KOBW which I think I know who that is I think it's Carl five stars it's titled voicing lives and he says the whole thing is making me feel like I'm sipping something nice in the mountains looking at the view the breeze I blow and I'm about to push my mouth and interject <laughs> Peter, we can hear you laugh after when we're not getting the note them right. Good job, Mike. I'm late to the party, but I'll keep coming back. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. So now let's get into this episode. This is episode six. And in this episode, I speak with my friend and colleague Marlon Sims. Now, it's a moment of culture, dance. We speak about his journey as a dancer, as a male dancer, and we talk about dance in general. I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation and I really hope that you enjoy hearing what was shared. Welcome to another episode of Mike's Moment Of. This episode is a moment of culture. We're talking about dance. And specifically with dance, we're talking with Marlon Sims, who is now the Dean of the School of Dance, Jamaica School of Dance, uh, which is at Edna Manley College. And he's also the director, artistic director of the National Dance Theatre Company. I've kind of known Marlon, boy, it's a long time, I know you. Um, let's, not, let's not say years. We were both in college. And Marlon is, uh, so he's involved in several aspects of, of dance. You know, he's a creative director. He's also a choreographer. He's a dancer. He's involved in dance education as well. But Marlon, let's talk first about your, your journey. Because, all right, when I first met you, you were at UWE. Right. Right? And I think it might have been the first, maybe the first time you were dancing, was it? Or, or? No, I actually danced before that. I started dancing in high school. Okay. And uh, uh, it was the St. Jacob High School Dance Club that I was a part of. And okay. we would enter the um, JCDC Dance Festival. Right. And so my training was not formal, though. Okay. It, okay. We had a teacher who used to teach mathematics. He was not a dance teacher, but okay. he was very good at conceptualizing um, movements, and he would get the vocabulary from us. Okay. And then he would structure it because he would attend the JCDC choreographer's workshop. Ah, okay. So he would get the ideas on composition. Well, thank God for him. You want to, call, you want to give him a shout out? Oh, yes, Mr. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, okay. definitely. Mr. Franklin Bennett was my oh, first dance nice. teacher. Well, can you imagine if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have you. <laughs> I can tell you that so. because I didn't even know I could dance. Exactly. I mean, I was interested in it because it was so engaging. It looked very entertaining and um, the dancers at the time in high school look at they were having fun and I wanted to have fun as well. Okay. So I was drawn to that. But okay. to have actually said I would have been here today, mm -hmm. you know, right. my younger self. <laughs> right, yeah, you, that, that you never saw this <laughs> Never saw today, never so, saw so today. So at that time when you were at St. Jenko, what, what kind of dance primarily were you doing? Was it folk or was it... Was it pop? Was it what, what kind of stuff was it? I mean, it was a popular dance group. Okay. Um, our focus was really on dance hall. Okay. And uh, so my introduction into dance was really dance hall. That was my wow. first love. And then to Mr. Franklin Bennett, we got exposure to 
creative folk B and creative folk A, which is what you hear, uh, for instance, when you go to festival, you hear them, you see them dancing to calypso and soca okay, music. Okay, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Right, or you have them do traditional folk uh, music. Right. Uh, um, Kumina and Gary. Okay. And so I got introduction to traditional Jamaican folk culture through that. Okay. And then we also were introduced to what was called creative dance back then, which is modern dance. Mm -hmm. So we're taught a creative form of expression using different kinds of movements and music. So, and then, um, so that was really my first exposure. And I got very interested in all different forms because all of them offered me a chance to express myself. Right. And so I just took to everything. So well, when I met you, you know, it was at UE with the UE Dance Society. Yes. And but you were doing modern dance in in that. I think it was it Howard Daly who had choreographed. Right. It was? You know, I met Howard Daly back in high school. Okay. Because he was asked to come in by our dance teacher, and I met him then, and so he introduced certain ideas that I didn't know about at that time, and certain technical training he introduced, but I didn't have him for a long time. So okay. seeing him at the University Dance Society when I left San Diego was like a reunion. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And so I. Met you right. when you came in to do the music, uh, the music for Joseph Roberts's right, right. Uh, I think it was called the Spirit Takes Flight. The Spirit Takes Flight, yes. And I ended up composing music for Howard's thing as well. You did, and you for did. For another one, I think, for about three different things. You did, and right. he did a duet at that time, and it was way ahead of its time. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it was myself and Kevin. I yes. remember he, Kevin also had, was a student at St. Jago, but he didn't study dance there or was in a dance club. Okay. So he picked up dance while he was at UWE. And somehow, both of us were in this dance at Dance Society at the same time yes. with Howard Daly, who had these ideas that were so far out. Right. He wanted to create from improvisation. <laughs> I've never improv before. <laughs> <laughs> and he just got us to feel very relaxed. And he created this work that was part movement, part music, yes. in silence, <laughs> yes. um, entrances and exits with some pedestrian movements. Yeah. So we could manage what we were given, mm -hmm. but they were so smartly it was a powerful, structured. It was a powerful work, that I thought. Yeah, at the time, yeah, it was clearly different and ahead of its time because at that time, I don't think there was anything like that that was happening on the Jamaican stage. True, true. And of course, your music... Um, added a, a particular dimension to the oral experience because it was also weird. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. It added it to was the avant garde. It was. De it was definitely <laughs> ahead of its time. Yeah. But I really enjoyed that experience, and I learned a great deal from Howard. I'm give him a, I mean, he passed on. Yes. But one of the things that he taught us was that. Um, Apart from tapping in and being comfortable with our bodies and being comfortable moving as two males in a dance, right. um, he always said to us, the dance is bigger than you. Okay. The dance is bigger than you. And we recognize what that. What did you we understand just, that to mean at the time? Well, at the time, I just thought that we were part of something that was global. Okay. Something that was powerful. Something that existed before generations. Something right. that we couldn't finish. And does it mean something ended. different to you now? No, it pretty much means the same, the same thing. thing. Okay. Okay. But now I have a deeper understanding why, because now I get to study the thing right. and research it some more. And I recognize that there are just layers and layers and layers right. to the art form. Okay. And you can never know enough. Every day is a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you recognize how much you don't know, you recognize how much larger it is. That makes sense. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, so what happened after UWE? Well, after you Dance Society, well, I was there f um, for about four years because even after I completed my degree, I still continued because I loved it so much. Right. It was a group that they tried new ideas. They worked with different choreographers. There was a really cool set of people, though, in that group. Oh, my goodness. Because Neela was in that group. Neela Ibn, Sabdil Hardware. Marcus James. Uh, Marcus James. Shelley Maxwell. Absolutely. Um, Anna had come because Anna, Anna was right. in the Spirit Takes Flight. Exactly. So it was, it was and it was, of course, a combination of persons who had competed against me in JCDC. Really? Who I'd really admired. Okay, okay. <laughs> and they, incidentally, were the, the, the protégés of uh, a generation of NDTC dancers and who had learned from the luminaries. Yes, yes. And so after they had learned from the luminaries, they went into the high school right, so and name, prep I mean, school. We have to keep dropping like names. Monica, Lawrence, Monica Lawrence, for Lawrence, instance. Right. That's where Neela hailed right. from. And Joseph. And well, Joseph, Joseph Robinson. Exactly. Right. And Barbara McDaniel yes. as well. And so you had all of these. Patsy Ricketts too. Patsy Ricketts, yeah, she yes. taught me. Right. And at the time when I went to Dance Society, the Cuban dancers had just come in. Um, right. Arsenio, Arsenio Andrade right. and 
Albeldo, okay. Toki, right. Right. Fonseca, Gonzalez. Yes. So the Cuban experience had landed on our shores. That's right. And they were two fantastic dancers, and we were just so electrified by them. And choreographers, too. I mean, yes. yes. And when they came to teach us, we were like, we're mesmerized. So I got close to Toki. Right. Because Toki was our main um, teacher. And he taught us Cuban folk. He taught us salsa merengue <laughs> um, and, and, and the traditional folk forms of Cuba. And it was very exciting. Wow. Okay. It was like an eye-opening experience for me. It's almost as though I couldn't have enough. If I wasn't careful, I failed everything at UA. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was hard to balance my love of dance and my need to finish at the, uh, an academic program. So what did you, what did you, like the degree, what degree did you do at UA? Well, I finished a degree in English. Okay. Literature in English, and I applied it to dance, incidentally, how, because how I love so? storytelling. Okay. I love storytelling. I love reading. I love the use of imagery and use of language. Wow. And so dance, it was just another creative output or creative experience for me. And the, the kind of intuition and analytical skills that I learned from literature, I brought it to dance. Wow. Okay. And so movements be- for me became storytelling. I, and I, I, I never sh- even thought of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's great. Okay. So I loved it. And of course, working with all these amazing dancers who hit from different spaces yes. and they were way ahead of me in terms of technical and performance skills. It was great being in their presence. I mean, I learned so much from Neela Ibanks and yes. Sabiel Hardware. And they took a chance on me, you know, okay. like Sabiel Hardware choreographed on me. And I said, wow, he had so many other dancers to choose from. Right. So here I was <laughs> at that time as a young dancer, danced with all these other experienced dancers. Who are not about wanting, the same age as you. But. Same age. <laughs> And I did not want to be left behind. Right. So I was just keeping up with them and giving them my best. And I was inspired by them. Yeah. That, that, but that season, for me, it still is one of the, I mean, paper, what is it called? Paper to Silver? Paper to Silver. Oh, it was the 25th anniversary or yes, something. It was, dance, yes, right? it was. That yes, was, it was. Yes, it was. It was amazing. I think, I think I still have the t-shirt somewhere. You do? But yeah. <laughs> Can't fit me, but I still have it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, right. you're welcome to pass it on. Oh, mm, I'm here. I'm oh, here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay. So, what brought you to Edna Manley? Well, well, even before I got to Edna Manley, though, um, in my final year, in the fourth year of my experience with UA Dance Society, um, Arlene Richards, because right. each year that I was in Dance Society, Professor Nedford would send Arlene Richards to come and remount a work of oh, his on okay. Dance Society. So he'd always have the NDTC Prof. Nedford presence ah, okay. in the repertoire. And she was working with me on Spirits at the Gathering. And she, she invited me to the trainee class. Okay. And I accepted the invitation and I went. And that was where my life began with NDTC. Okay. Um, what led me to Edna Manley College? Well, I've always wanted to teach. That was my passion. Um, the lawyer thing surfaced at some point, you know. Oh, okay. Everybody wants their child to become lawyer, Dr. Yes, Indian Chief. Yes. And I had a vision that I could probably become a good lawyer, but there was an interest I had in dance that would, I could not get over. Okay. And uh, I was teaching English language and literature at Murgrove High School. Okay. But I couldn't forget dance. I started, I revived the dance club there when I was there, and I brought dance into the English classroom. Oh, really? Yes. So when my students came for literature class, they would bring their change of clothes. Okay. We would go into the auditorium. They were uh, remaking the scenarios in the, lit- in the stories and creating movements. So how did, how did the administration at, at the school feel about this? Well, they definitely thought I was different. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting it mildly. I was introducing a new kind of methodology into the classroom. And as long as I was getting the results, okay. Okay. they were quite okay with it. And they were pretty supportive. Okay. For them, it was avant-garde. For me, it was life. Yes, yes. There was yes. no other way I could have done it. Yeah. And I enjoyed that experience thoroughly. And I said, you know what? I can't be at Murgo forever because I've always wanted to be at Edna Manley College because that's where the dance is. Right. You know, it's the first and only of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, they have a rich history of dance, and I wanted to be a part of that. So I went away. I got leave, and okay. I went away, and I did my master's in dance. Where? At Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Okay. And I, I had to do it. What does a master's in dance look like? Is it, is it, is it more, more research stuff, or is it, is it more dancing? Is it choreography? What, or, or is it? Can you choose? It was a wonderful experience because it was a combination of both things. You could okay. perform okay. and choreograph. The master's focus was really in choreography. I see. But you had to do a course in theater. Oh, great! And then you were you had to do a course, an undergraduate course in technique. 
mm-hmm. and then all the technique classes in the undergraduate program were open to you. What about what about dance notation? Because that's something I want to talk to you about. Oh yes, later on. and that was a big part of the focus because it was a concentration in lab notation and choreography. Okay. So basically, you study lab notation up to the um, intermediate level. Okay. And then, as a part of your thesis concert, you remount a dance work from a score. From previously written score. Or previously written was, score. Okay, not bad. Okay. Right. And that is how Sweet in the Morning end up on the NDTC. Ah, okay. okay. Because that was my score right. to interpret for my thesis concert. Oh, okay. But is, is Laban, um, is it specific to a particular type of dance, a particular style, or can it, is it applicable to anything? To anything folk? at all. Really? Anything at all. So even dance hall and stuff you can... Dance hall, folk, modern, jazz, ballet, ballet everything. every okay. single thing under the sun, because what it is, is just a language. Okay. okay. And every single movement can be interpreted using a symbol. I got you. Okay. Right. So similar way with music, mm-hmm. you hear notes. Right. And every note can represent it on uh, the uh, sim- around the staff. Right. Right. Okay. It's the same thing with it. So okay. Okay. All right. So after after the masters, the, oh, but before we go after the masters, is there any any particular high point that anything that stood out while you're doing the masters? Oh my goodness, there were so many fine points. All right, because I was so hungry for dance when I went to. Um, and it was my first time, I got really excited. Okay. Um, and they, I just wanted to do everything. So for instance, I did one thing. In my second year was when you're supposed to present your thesis concert. Right. No, no, no. Marlon had to put on a concert in his first year. <laughs> you're so Jamaican. <laughs> I had to put on a concert in my first year. And I, I taught them Kumina. Oh, wow. And let me tell you, it's a school that is predominantly... Um, upper class kids as a private university and they normally come in uh, at a very high grade level in ballet so they come in on point shoes so when I'm talking about Jamaican folk they are clueless to it because ballet is really up and and Kumana is really grounded grounded. yes okay so it was quite a phenomenal experience so it was almost as though they're having this unusual exciting experience that never had and a cultural immersion they connected with ancestors they never knew they had never knew they had (laughs) (laughs) suddenly everybody was caribbean everybody was black and everybody was jamaican (laughs) and so i had a very good rapport with the lecturers and with the students and they were always waiting what is martin going to come with now (laughs) so that was very exciting so you took over their school great oh my goodness Uh, in my final year i was able to do another dance that was remounted from score called The Beloved. And but is we, that also in, did you do that as well? Actually, when we did Beloved on the NDTC, that is how I met the college professor. Okay. And she was the one who told me about the master's program. I see. Okay. So right. that, that happened before Sweet in the Morning? That's happened before Sweet in the okay. Morning. If okay. I didn't meet her, I would not have gone to SMU. Ah, okay. Because okay. at that time I was searching for a program everywhere and I couldn't find one because I didn't have any money. I was determined to get my master's, yes. but I wanted as you somewhere. Do, as you do, <laughs> I wanted somewhere I could offer me a full scholarship. Yes, as you do, I, of course. <laughs> and so, when she came to the NDTC to remount the beloved, um, she was reading from a score, and I was very curious. She go back to her book and come back and tell us what to do. And I said, "What are you reading? Show me." And she showed it to me. I said, "Where can I learn that?" Wow. And she said, "It's taught at my university." I said, "Which university is that?" Because I'm looking for a master's program. She says, "Really? We take four every two years." I said, "How many persons are in the program?" She says, three. I said, can I sign up? There's a space. This was in June, you know. <laughs> yes. I said, can I sign up? She says, of course. And I said, um, do you have scholarships? She said, yes. Let me tell you. I applied in June and August I was on the plane. That's fabulous. Okay. Full Great. scholarship. Cover. They gave me a stipend. Yes. The only thing I had to find was my airfare. We hear this story so often. Oh, my from, goodness. <laughs> from, from Jamaicans. Um, I'll tell you my story on another podcast. Yes. But, um, I know. Stories. I'll be here for it. Yeah. So... Oh, there was something. And we were talking earlier about uh, what else had happened. And right. so that's how I talked about right. the Beloved exactly. at the NDTC. Right. Yes. So in, in, as a part of my program too, we did the Beloved with my classmate. And um, we both performed it on the season of Dallas Black. Dallas okay. Black Dance Company is one of the most outstanding dance companies. In Dallas. In Dallas, okay. um, in Texas, and in the entire United States. Oh, okay. And so that was quite an honor to be welcomed in the wow. home of Dallas Black, to have gone to their rehearsals, to be on stage with them. That was a phenomenal, exp- phenomenal oh, experience. Fabulous. Okay. So that was great. And, you know, I said to myself, I got offers to stay. They're like, why don't you dance here? And, you know, employment you know, right. opportunities were coming my way. Yes. But I said, no, yeah. I want to be home in Jamaica to dig 
of soil. Right. I want to be home to build. I'm not very good at trimming the edges that have already been planted by Why others. Why do we like to suffer? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Because I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a special love I have in my heart for Jamaica yes. because I recognize that who I am is partly is due to who um, all the people in my life were of given course. to me. Of course, yes. and I just felt that I had to give back, and I, I, because I love education so much, it was my way of giving back. And I'm always been concerned about young people mm-hmm. where they're going in their own lives, and I wanted to help them in so many different ways. Okay. I have, a, I have a quick question, and it goes back to the notation thing. Sure. And it might be a, a little bit of a, of a detour, but we'll come back. Um, Definitely. So, that, so I just have to ask what I remember. Right. So with the Laban notation, because you, you, know, you have the, the dance and stuff, but then you also have things like Grand Gala, which is this big, you know, a, yes. a big field of 100 or 500 people. Or right. So I remember, because I, if you remember, I was in this ice skating show, and they do a lot of that kind of pattern stuff right. with, the, with, the, with the skaters. Right. And I, and I saw the person, the choreographer, with a book as well. Right. But it looked like graph paper, which I think is different from the Laban. But they were, I think, basically they had patterns. Right. And where, where one pattern would go to the next pattern. Right. You know, with the ice skaters, they have things like the wheel. Yes. It goes in circles. And there's, you know, there's different groups of them that go off and do different things. Yes. It's still choreography. Right. You know, but it's slightly different. Do you think there's a way for Laban or maybe even that, whatever that skater was doing, to, right. to some, somehow merge and become something that can map out what happens on a, on a, on a stadium field. Oh, um, of course, of course, of course. I mean, the multiplicity of opportunities within Laban to record things is okay. immeasurable. And, and if, to plan ahead of time, too. I mean, because so you could, choose, could do this choreography, be, I, potentially you could do this choreography before the, you actually meet the bodies and have it correct. ready. Correct, correct. And I mean, it... For with Laban, what is good about it is that it is supported in so many different ways by other ways of recording it. Okay. So, for instance, you have a dance that you're working on. You have the videographer who is there. Right. So you, you're you're video recording the rehearsal, and then you have the the notator who's right. recording it on paper. So both uh, process of documentation balance each other out. Okay. Okay. Because the notator understands the body and how the body moves, there are certain things that will not necessarily be visible. On okay. film, okay, and then the notator is able to record those specific so kind of details, details or whatever. Okay. Correct. Okay, and it is so detailed in terms of where the eye is looking, um, even with your finger is pointing, how right. much tension is in the body. Right, it records those different things because that, that that's essentially notating attitude. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and, okay. And so it is. It is. It is very detailed, and it's, that's why it's a specialized okay. uh, profession. There are not many in the world. How many people are in Jamaica who are? Who there is none in Jamaica actually. And when I was doing my so math, you don't count yourself. No, I'm not a notator. Okay. Because you have to go onto the advanced level, I see. and then you have to be licensed. Wow. Okay. So it it would take further studies. When I my f- program ended, yeah. I just completed the intermediate level. Okay. I found an app actually that that you can that you can use on iPad. Oh they really? Laban notation. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. I'll show it to you afterwards. Yeah. Please do. I'm interested. Yeah. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So masters, fine. Yes. Uh, and what happens after? Well, yes. I came back to Jamaica, and I to suffer. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> no. You know. You see, I'm 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 always a fight, and I'm always determined because I've always see myself as having a, a purpose that I really wanted to carry out, and I think I would have been haunted by it if I didn't pursue it or live the experience that I thought was meant for me. And that was about sharing and giving. And because I knew Edna Manley College was where I wanted to work, and it was a place where I could combine both things, my love for English and my love for dance, it, it just felt right. And when I came, you know, I had a very funny experience when I was coming here for the job because I came to Dr. Johnson. She was the director of the school at the time. I said, right. Dr. Johnson, I have to work here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so you're not asking, you're just saying. I, I, no, I have to. Yeah. I brought my my resume, my letter. I was ready. I said, "What?" I said, "I have so many things I could teach, and I love to teach. Can I get a job? In fact, I want a job." And she saw that I was eager and yes. passionate, and she said, "Okay, okay, you know, we work at it, we look at it." And so I got a part-time job at first. Okay. Prior to that, I uh, then VP. Hamilton. Yes. She was um, not VP back then. Okay. She was running a program and it was summer school. Okay. And I was, I didn't, I, there was something that was bothering me or something that I was consumed by because I had so many ideas about how it could go. Okay. So I went to the, I went to the VP Hamilton's office and I was there and was very impassioned and I was saying that this could be done and that could be done. And I was, I don't know if she had interpreted that I was upset. I was just passionate. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was just very passionate. And so when I returned and I approached Mr. Duhaney, yes, who was the principal back then, and I approached Dr. Johnson, and of course, uh, Mrs. Hamilton, who had known me from that, must have been an uncomfortable encounter. Right. <laughs> they just said, okay, get him to work here. What year was that? This was 2005 when I just came back. Oh, that's when I came here as well. Oh, really? Okay, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I came back part time when I started working and I was teaching dance hall. Okay. In the evening school, yes. Okay. People can't imagine. Yes. Yeah. And, Inter- you know, interesting. <laughs> Jenny Jenny was in my class. What? Jenny Jenny was in my class. To this day, Jenny tells everyone that I use a teacher. teacher. <laughs> 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 like, oh, you stay so young. Oh, yes. Oh. And so, and then after that year now, I became full time. Right. And I was, I was employed as an English teacher and a teacher of dance. So I was between the education department, um, the School of Arts Management and Humanities, what it is now, right. and the School of Dance, just straddling yeah. the two schools. Yeah, I was part time in 2005. Oh, you one were? For a year, and then, and then they made me full time after that. Oh, so you did the same thing same, more? Same oh, thing, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Did you also go to VP, by, VP Hamilton's office? No, <laughs> I, I, went to, I went to Roger. Express <laughs> your passion. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So yes, okay, interesting. Okay, all right. So, but sorry. So there's NDTC as well. No, no. There's a connection with with Edna Manley and NDTC. Well, well, I mean, it might not be official, but there is a there is a, a unofficial connection because I mean, it really is kind of a feeder. Well, what I had what had happened right? It was Jamaica School of Dance prior to being a part of the Edna Manley College as a part of the six schools, and it was started by Sheila Barnett, Bert Rose, and Barbara Requa. Right. And you know, with NDTC spearheading the founding of the school a right. lot of the principles and ethos of the company filtered into the school okay and the idea was that they would create cultural agents these person that would go out and help to shape jamaica's identity through dance and inspire hope and give people a cult and a sense of who they are okay and so that philosophy continued and so members of the school would sort of see a natural progression to become a member of the national dance theater company mm-hmm. um 2020 there are so many companies now. Yes. So many interests, wide and varied. And with a degree program now on board, a lot of persons see the world as being their stage. True. So, yes, persons are still interested in the National Dance Theatre Company, but they also have other dreams have as well. <laughs> yes, that we support. <laughs> yes. Because yes. we want everyone to be successful. Right. And so we provide mentorship and guidance and support. Um, Sometimes even directives, because sometimes we see persons going away that, hey, 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 you're, yeah. think about this other option okay, that you're okay. not giving any thought to. Um, and so it has just been a wonderful journey for us as a faculty to work with students in achieving their dreams and their goals, to present to them options that they may not have considered, to connect them with persons who can help them, because a lot of what is involved in dance is networking. Right. You okay. know, who you know, who knows you, and who you can help to get to know each other so right. they can find help for that person. Um, and so that has been the, the journey. Yes, there is a connection with the NETC and the School of Dance, but there's a connection with other companies too. True, true, true. true because true. in the school, we have persons who are attached to other companies. Yes, and, we and have, even more so today than and ever before, I think. Right, yeah. right. And we see that as a part of the success of the school because we have two members of staff who... Um, one is part time and the other one is full time. Who are with La Carco United and right. United Caribbean Dance Force. Mm-hmm. Um, we have Nile Banks. She used to be with the NDT. So now she has her own company called N Company. Right. We have um, Lee Rose, who is also an independent artist doing her own work in photography and videography yes. and dance. And so it's an eclectic staff mm-hmm. that reflects a kind of global perspective on dance, which we're very happy to have because their dance, dance is quite, and it's not one dimension as people see it. Right, true, true. Okay, let's talk about being a man in dance, especially yes. in Jamaica. How has that perception and how has that kind of involvement changed since you started in dance because it looked differently right uh, because I'm, I'm sure at one point you'd see more men in doing dance hall dance right or you might find them doing some of the more in like in the rural areas doing the, the folk right and not necessarily so much on stage doing the modern dance it, right. it's a few but now i mean yes just we speak on it well dance has been stigmatized for a very long time it's not just in jamaica it's globally right uh, where people see that dance is a female Okay. Um, activity, but not just on a social level as it regards concert dance okay. and modern dance and creative dance. They see it as something that women do because in the eyes of 
some cultures and some individuals, it is soft, it is expressive, right. and men look vulnerable. Yeah. So therefore, if you are looking that vulnerable, that then you must be weak. And of course, they've attached some negative names to to men. Right, who, right, and, right. and it's really about their perception. Right. Um, not really understanding that the kind of rigor and work that you're putting becoming a dance artist it's not it's not for everyone it's extremely difficult and demanding and if a man steps up to the plate and says this is what i want to do kudos to him it's yeah. extraordinary work and sometimes when you expose persons to dance they develop an appreciation and a newfound respect for males true okay who do it right my own journey was one that i'm so grateful for because my father was supportive. Oh, that's great. Extremely okay. supportive. And when I look back on it, I, sat, I thank God for him. You know, he passed on four years ago, but oh, okay. he was behind me 100%. And I don't think I would have reached as far as I have had, it, had he not been there to shoulder me as a male, as a mentor, as a role model. Right. Because for him, I could be anything I wanted to be. And unfortunately, not many males have that in their mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. I remember my father used to come to all the shows he was a photographer by, by profession he oh. come to all the shows with his camera <laughs> <laughs> proud of him son man. so proud yes. take pictures and i would introduce him and of course even after my early years in high school and moving on to the ndtc who come to the shows as well you know yes, yes. extremely supportive and i thank god for him i wish every parent would be as supportive right. as him my mother also but i speak more to my father because he's a male he's a male right okay um and he was just extremely supportive but i really wish that other persons had that level of support and for every child that's out there who wants to pursue dance and for every parent who's perhaps listening support your child mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes it may not fall within what you envision your child to be because right. every parent has a dream of what their child could become yeah but you know, the child has their own dreams so. yeah <laughs> so. you don't primarily you don't want your child to choose a profession where they end up suffering right and people normally associate the arts with people struggling to survive yeah i mean look how successful you are michael you're doing mm. pretty well look at you okay <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that at another time um, <laughs> but yes i think the measure of success can be who it is that they in, see are in their immediate environment who is successful right and who can mentor them and i've had great mentors as well oh, that you're very fortunate though. oh my goodness yeah. it's really been a blessing oh. professor <coughs> nederford right um barry moncrief our sweet sweet dear nice uncle yes, barry yes yes um and in high school my my maths teacher right as i told you before yes, 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 <laughs> who yes. was teaching me dance mr franklin bennett yes. and the other males too clive thompson who mm. was a bert rose and so you had powerful strong figures in dance who would help me right along yes, the way yes 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 and tony wilson let me just call his name yes yes um and also from Ashe, Joe. yeah, J okay. Joseph Robinson. Yeah. So they were an inspiration to mm. us. Um, and that is how I perceive it in terms of people being successful and pursuing it. You have to have persons around right. who act as mentors, yes. who can dispel uh, the stigma mm -hmm. and show them that it is a legitimate profession that has a real contribution to make to the development right. of society and to the individual. So uh, do you think that, because in my opinion and from my observation, there's a lot more males in dance now. Do you think the dance hall, especially because, it, you know, the dance hall dance, it grew and it became a lot of these crews of mostly men dancing. And so as I think the perception changed. And I think from that, a lot of people thought, well, I mean, I'm doing, I'm dancing and I'd love to learn more. I'd love to maybe even make this dance hall thing that I'm doing, advance it somehow. And by, by advancing it, I would, I would want to learn more technique. So I'm exploring uh, modern dance and folk dance and seeing how I can inform the dance hall with that. You are in dance education. I want to know how you feel about the impact that dance hall dance has on having more males in dance generally. Right. I think that it has increased the number of dance, uh, male dancers involved right now in the profession, uh, whether they're earning from it or not, has certainly increased since I was in high school in dance for the first time. I remember someone, it was said to me back then when I um, went to the national finals, that was 1992, thereabout, <laughs> oh my goodness. And I was um, entered in the male category, the, sorry, the solo category, right. and I won the national award um, for my solo at that time. I was the only male, I remember. Wow. And I'm looking around thinking that there's no one else. And it was said to me back then that, you know, it was really quite rare for a male to move on to the national level to do exactly what I did. And I was, I found a little bit 
disturbing. Right. You know, because I'm saying, where are all the other males who have the dream and passion that I have? Where are they? But today, 2020, what I'm seeing now is an explosion of different male groups in dancehall, partly because there is an economic thrust True. to it. They're because you, know, you can monetize all of this. You can, you're going around touring and exactly. teaching your, the dancehall vocabulary. Exactly. And, right. Opportunities And it's on TV earn. a lot as well. There's Dancing yes. Dynamite. There's all these different things. There's, Absolutely. There's, there's a new, well, new quote-unquote, not new anymore, but with the, within the festival period. We know the competition we're yes, talking about yes. and in there's, JCDC. There's, there's, there's people competing from other countries from as well. From other countries that come that. to compete in that. Right. right. So there is a monetization of the of the industry people recognize now that they can earn from it and promote themselves right. in ways that they've never been used to. And never social used media, to. Is, social is, media is, is a big part of that. Absolutely. They can right. brand themselves exactly. and brand their group. And as you said earlier, get the chance to not only perform and be paid whether as an individual or as a group, but also get the chance to travel overseas right. to conduct workshops, pass on their knowledge, and teach dance. They can become brand ambassadors for different companies yes. or even for the country or whatever. Yes, absolutely. So, you know. Um, as it pertains to concert dance, which require them to be um, more explorative in terms of creative dance, right. as, as it used to be called, or modern dance, um, that hasn't taken off in quite the way that dance hall has. Right. Because we don't have a professional um, company in Jamaica where, in fact, you know, we could work towards being as a part of a professional company right. and learn a different dance style and become that kind of artist. Um, but... The interesting thing is when you speak to these male dancers sometimes they express a desire to learn that form. Right. Because being involved in dance you recognize that there's value in all kinds of dances. Right. And you do find some of these some of these um, guys who are in the dance hall groups are also either guest dancers on, on, the, on these companies yes. these, uh, these other companies or they or they dance with the company as well as do their, their dance hall thing as well. Right. Um, I remember when I first came and w I was working here, as I said before, from 2005. I mean, you had one, two, three male dancers. And I said, you know, I have to do something about this. And I remember I specifically went out and recruited male dancers. And one year we had 10, which was unbelievable. I think I remember when you did that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when, we, when, I began, when I went out there and I began talking to people, there is lots of interest. Yes. And the fact that you're not going to them to have that conversation, they sometimes don't feel they have the confidence to do it on their own. Right. Okay. Okay. And so I was able to advise some of them to kind of dispel some of the perceptions that they have, to encourage them to do it, and most important, to find them the money to do it. Yes, that's important. Very important. Yeah. So they may have a dream of coming to Edna Manley College and studying much more than dance hall, expanding their reach and their range, but they just don't have the money to do it. Right, okay. okay. And that has been a big, big challenge. But going back into to the early 90s, I remember you had a major dance group that used to enter a festival called Greg, Gregory Park Dancers. Okay. I don't know if they're, they're still around. Right. But today, you have so many male yeah. dance Countless. groups. Countless. I can't Countless. keep up sometimes. So uh, Something I observed, though, with... With a lot of these dance groups, is that a lot of the choreography tends to be the same. Yes, it's, it either tends to be the same or it's all facing forward. But some people, are, some other groups are very creative. I must yes. say, but by and large, a lot of it is the same. It's, right. you know, it's facing forward. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of jerky movements. Are there ways that we can we can address that with them, or is it do they have to become involved in dancing dynamites or in or, or Edna Manley? Or is JCDC going to help with that? Or you know, when you look at at the dance competitions you see on television, yes. you know, the US ones, and even some of the companies who come here from Japan or whatever, right. they're doing a lot of really creative stuff with their, with their, with their choreography. There's levels, there's, you know, there's, there's different angles that are happening at the same time. Right. There's a lot of thought and creativity that's yes. put into it. And so how, how do you get them over that hump of saying, okay, so I'm doing these dance hall moves that, are, that anybody can do at a street dance, but now I'm on stage. Yes. It needs to look different. Um, I think what has really sunk into the minds of the creators of these different experiences for social media, you normally, you normally see them on social media, yes. is that they're creating for a, a, a video, a music video effect. Right. And in a music video effect, things are presentational right. somewhat. So you have to face the camera. So like what you would see with Thriller. I right, don't know, right, music video. Right. Everything was to the camera, to yes, the camera, yes, so you play yes. into the camera. Um, in terms of composition and being, as you say, outside of the box and employing more elements of composition, mm -hmm. I know the JCDC has had workshops okay. 
where entrants in the competition are those who are interested in or persons who have entered before can attend these workshops and learn different ways of approaching choreography. Dance and Dynamite 2, through their affiliation with the School of Dance, have also sent their participants yes. to the School of Dance to receive help from the lecturers who are skilled in those areas. And you see the different elements of what they learn coming out in their work. Okay. And we hope that through that, it can filter into the community because they are being watched by other persons who want to do the same thing. Okay. And once they see them trying new things based on what they learn at the school, they will try new things as well. Um, but that's a slow process. And sometimes when I believe, not quite sure, never actually asked, but when they watch videos on YouTube and they see them having certain hits and certain numbers, right. they may feel inclined to try to copy in some way what it is that they see right. that people are responding to okay. in terms of what has gone viral. Which is a good thing. Yeah, Which, of, yeah. Right. And as you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a kind of cross-pollination. Yes. yes. So the, the popular dances from the United States in terms of hip-hop yes. filter into onto our shores. We see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It sort of feeds its way into our vocabulary yes. and vice versa. And vice versa yeah. What they see us doing goes over right. to their show and they adopt yeah. what it is that they see as well. And then uh, you mentioned a, a word earlier, jerk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I think dance has become very dynamic and percussive and strong and, right. and, and quick, which is a, a different style altogether in terms of how it was done in the early 90s. True. You know, True. Yes. where it kind of slow kind of and fluid. fluid. And there, there are lots of undulating and kind of organic. Right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. That sort of cool and deadly vibe right. has now become very spastic it's, and it's sharp. Very, it's uh, kind of militaristic almost. Um, right. And some groups have either have sped up the music. Yes. And if it's not fast, it's not tech. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what they're trying to do too, they're also competing with each other online. Yes. They really want more is, is energy. It really yeah. is what they're trying to increase. Um, right. With, with, the, with the speed and with also with the jerkiness of the movements. Okay. Right. So okay. There's, there's a level of competitiveness that's happening too that they're responding to. It's really about who can get the most attention from your online profile. Right, I got you. And so you want to try different things. Sometimes they speed it up, sometimes they slow it down. Right. Sometimes they try the they levels. Put, they put in special effects like, you know, gunshots and, right. and you know, exactly. bullet things. Or yes, yeah. and sometimes it's and different and editing yes. um, ideas that they've used. Right. Because some of them are also investing in equipment. Which, which is good. Right. And downloading apps and programs on their computer to yes. try different ways of... And that's wonderful, actually. I mean, yeah. That's really, that's good. Okay. Recently, we had um, Jamaica Dance Umbrella. And this was what, yes. year, year 11, I think, or 12? I think it's probably year 12. Year 12, right. I think so. and, and this is the dance festival, Michael Hogate's brainchild. Right. Uh, that was put on at, at Philip Sherlock. Yes. At Dance Umbrella, which is, a great, which is wonderful. I think it's wonderful. You have all these, almost every company in, in Jamaica, plus companies from other countries. Right. Coming, and you're seeing these different styles, and um, you know, you're hearing new music, and you're, you're seeing different types of choreography, and they have something called the dance collab which yes. is usually dancers or choreographers with people who are in other areas right um so you see a lot of really creative things yes as somebody who, who's been involved and, and ndtc this year was recognized you got an award from them right from, right being involved in the dance umbrella how how do you think the different dance companies and choreographers are are taking information from what they see from other people do you think they're 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 just seeing it and letting it be or, or are they seeing elements that they would include in their choreography or they would might, might want to try or are they afraid of going okay i'm not gonna touch this especially people who are especially from the choreographers who are in in jamaica because you, you all know each other everybody knows each right. other and the companies know each other um actually sometimes which is great actually i'm, I'm, I'm taking another <laughs> tangent because in the past with theater groups and dance groups there's a lot of of of, of separation and mm -hmm. and a lot of kind of bad blood <laughs> and, okay. and, I, and i don't i don't feel that as much anymore right. and i think that's been, it's been a, a a concerted effort from the people who are involved and the people who are know it you just said you know we're, we're friends we know each right. other and if you need my dancers to help you with uh, in this season yes. yes you can have them yes. and, you know and you, you can can you come and choreograph a piece on my yes. company yes. which is which is awesome i mean right. this is how it should have been forever right so <laughs> but um so yeah do, do you do you see that kind of cross pollination in a sense well yes i mean i do see it where choreographers who are exemplary in different ways you know maybe asked to choreograph on different companies i mean the ndtc has done that we have also our, our choreographers within our space 
um, have also choreographed and other companies right. in other spaces with the support of Professor Nedford when he was alive, with the support of Mr. Moncrief when he was alive. And of right. course, I support it as a continuation of that. Right. Um, I personally don't believe in what may be a division between spaces Good. because most of the persons who are now growing in the profession, um, and unfortunately, we have a change in regard, probably too soon for my liking mm -hmm. at all, yeah. <laughs> is um, the fact that we're all friends and we all create start from the same place, it would seem, because I met as I said before, Neela Ibans and Sabdel Hardware at the University of the West Indies. Right. And even though we end up dancing with different companies, that bond that we shared in that space still there. is still there. Right. So what has happened now in 2020 uh, on a Jamaica dance umbrella stage, we see an eclectic showing of what's really happening in the dance community and in dance theater, which I think an audience has developed an appreciation for. Right. because it's 12 years, so they look forward to seeing yes. what is really happening in the different spaces. And of course, you get a glimpse into what's happening in the other parts of the world. True. So you have a perspective of where am I in terms of my creativity and my art? And our international landscape. Exactly. How right. does my work add up to it? Or how does it compare? Or can it still hold its own? Or where is dance moving in other spaces? Okay. You know. Um, so there's something that I see, and again, I'm, I'm not a dancer or a choreographer, I mean, I've been forced to dance but, um, <laughs> when, when I was in Asia and Little People with Joe. Good job. But, um, and so I do have a perspective, but I, you know, I'm, I've never told anybody I'm a, you know. Right. So, but, but there's something I, I observe. It's hard to articulate, I guess, being a non-dancer choreographer. But there's some of the vocabulary that you see just, you, it's like you see it all the time. It's, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's movements that happen, there's, yes. there's shapes that happen, and they're happening a lot in, in, in different companies. You know, there, there's a thing where there's the, the arm movements and whatever, and then at some point, the whole company goes upstage into a, a little bunch and then the lights mm -hmm, is above mm -hmm, them. And mm -hmm. you see that, I'm, I'm seeing that a lot. Right. Uh, especially over the past three or four years, I've seen that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, where's that coming from and, and how can we get out of this pattern <laughs> <laughs> of, of seeing the same things? Um. <laughs> well, in terms of, it, there are some similarities that you'll see in many companies. Is that a modern, modern dance thing or what is right. that? Right. And it has to do with a global movement of dance, that's okay. one. Or it may just be that there is a choreographer who likes to work in a particular way. Uh, okay. I and you see. may see their work not just on one company but on other companies okay, okay. and so I guess you're referring to what would be a sameness yes um, the injection of freshness comes from fresh choreographers I see. or okay. fresh insight or a core may choose to just divert and go a different direction that they've been going different. all along so just to present something fresh on the stage um, so and it's always the difficult job of an artist or director in any space to create an experience that is unique and fresh to an audience that's coming in. I mean, there are works that you'll always see that will never lose their value. True. That, that is are true. just staple pieces. Like there's, there's one, there's a, a work, and it's actually on Lakat Kano, but it was Lantern who did it. When you guys were at... Um, it was it Hung Four of the Drum? Hung Four of the Drum. I, I mean, to this day, it's still one of my favorite dances. Right. One of my favorite pieces of choreography. Right, right, right. It, right. Just, it just doesn't get old for me. Right, No matter right. what changes with it, because yes. she, she has done different things, but yes. it, it has such power. Right. Me. And so that's exactly it. You have signature works that will always be there, that be treasures, that will never change unless the choreographer comes in and changes it. Right. And that you, you don't mind seeing repeatedly. Right. I mean, the, there are other companies across the world that will end their show with this one piece every right. single time. Yeah. And it's an audience but, uh, favorite. I mean, nobody, right. I mean, you can't get tired of that. Right, right, <laughs> right. That, that, those are the works that are solid. What I think you're referring to, uh, based on what I'm hearing, is just the need for constant experimentation and exploration of ideas. Because sometimes, I guess sometimes, some, a, a choreographer might go, this is my style. Right. Um, but I think at, at, at a point when, when you see the style repeating mm -hmm. in that way, I think mm -hmm. at some point you need to go, okay, I need to expand the, the vocabulary or... You know, think of something new to yes. to evolve what my style is right. to something more, or you know. Right. Uh, what I've witnessed, if I I've witnessed the growth of artists. I mean, when um, Jean, for instance, came to Jamaica and he did um, um, a, a dance on us back then, that was called Incantation. Right. The way he's choreographing now in 2020 is completely different. The vocabulary uh -huh. has changed. The movement ideas have changed. He has used different music. The experiences that he brings to his pieces now are different he has grown as an artist right. grown as a choreographer and so to have his works um and just because he has spent much of his time developing what he has been working on over mm -hmm. these many years um and that influences what he does on stage however not everyone will be able to say okay fine i've seen one work i've seen them all right so we keep going back to see what he's doing right right um and i think that comes back to programming also for any dance company. Your job is to really create a program 
to present to the public that will be artistically rich mm. and has high entertainment value. Right. And that's always a difficult balance to, to strike. I'm testing you now because I, I can't remember who, which company this is on. There's a, there's a work, and I, and I don't remember who did it. I don't remember it was Toke who, who choreographed it. Where there's like a, a drum on stage and there's three guys coming out of the drum. Is that movements? Oh, yes, it's on movements. It's called Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. That's another right. one that can't leave me. I mean, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's really is brilliant. Is it who, who did that? No, it's not Toke. It was actually a Cuban who did it. Okay. And, and um, I believe Arsenio had danced it. I'd seen Arsenio yes, dance it. Yeah. Amazing. It's, it's really amazing, it's amazing. Amazing work. And you kind of see at the very end. What I love about it is the striking image of the Neanderthal. Yes. So yes, see, yes, see the, the evolution and, of and my, the lighting is, is striking it's brilliant. as well. Yeah. It really is yeah. brilliant. And that's why I say you'll always have signature works that are masterpieces. You'll always have a song that you'll always listen to. He's, Whitney Houston has done quite a few. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Right. Um, and back to your point about artist reinvention. Mm -hmm. I think similarly in pop music, and I'm talking because I know you know a lot about music. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's like you have an artist like Madonna. She's now in her 60s. Right. And if you look at all of Madonna's albums, she reinvents her ta herself every, every single time yeah. with everything she puts out. Mm -hmm. um, for her to have had a longevity in music as she has had, I mean, that is some incredible yeah. range of talent yeah. and skill and, a lot and of, work. And a lot of risk too, you know what I mean? Yes. You have to take a risk. You may not like what it is that she's going to come up with, right. but she's going to come up with something different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there are choreographers in Jamaica who try that too. Yes. Um, you may not have the appetite to digest all that they come up with, but mm. I respect the artist who does. Yes, for sure. To try to put new things out there and create a new experience, something that you've never seen before. Think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. um, Neela Ibanks tends to do that a lot. Yes, <laughs> definitely. definitely. Oni Price tends to do that a lot. True. Um, you, not, will not, you will not always like everything, but there's always something in it for you. Yeah, but for you have you. to appreciate their, their willingness to, 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 try. to try something different. To experiment, different, yeah. do something new. Or the subject of music, as you mentioned. So uh, there's another thing that I observed. There's a lot of, there's a lot of use of pre-existing music. Is there a resistance to working with someone to create original music for, mm -hmm. for the works? Or is it just easier? Or is it because I get this vibe from this music, let me just work with this? Does it make it difficult when you have to tour or travel with mm -hmm. music that is not original for your work? Um, mm -hmm. what, what's, what do you think? Well, I mean, I believe that there is also the option of creating new music. And I don't know what would be the choices for some choreographers when they decide on the, doing what it is that they want to do. So I, for instance, go by whatever I hear. Okay. I mean, I can, I can watch a movie, and there's a portion of a movie where the, film, the, the sound comes up. Right. And I said, what song is that? What music is that? And I whip out my yeah, yeah, phone Shazam or something. and Shazam it. Yes. Um, that works for me. Um, there are instances, too. We're very fortunate in the NDTC to have a choir, right. singers, so and musicians. Music. So you can create music for right. pieces. We know it's a process and it takes time. So sometimes there are time constraints where right. you can't get something done yeah. to meet the deadline for the show that you want to have. Yeah. Um, and working in these different constraints will pose challenges for the choreographer. But Jamaica is a wellspring of talent in all forms. Um, and uh, I believe that choreographers have explored the use of live music yes, and yeah. original composition right. or original arrangement. Yes. I mean... Garabenta is an arrangement of different kinds of folk songs. True. And the way it is weaved together was, you know, about the vision a professor had never had for that particular work and working with Margie Wiley. Right. For right. her to arrange the mm -hmm. music for it. Mm -hmm. um, are we seeing enough of that today? Mm, are we? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe not. What we have is a lot of recorded music. Right. And it may just go back to time. Remember, these companies are also part-time you know, true and mm. um, they have a win in which to produce something um and perhaps that can affect the choices that you make okay you know how much but time does, you have does to that dedicate affect how, how international you can get with your stuff if you're not like if you're not having the rights to use this music mm -hmm. that you love is it a factor really or, or, or does it matter well i've not had a scenario in uh, or heard of a scenario in Jamaica where an artist was prevented from using a particular okay. music but if they went went elsewhere with the music would, would that Right. In so fact, I've, not, I've actually heard of one scenario where one choreographer was told, I think the choreographer had posted a clip of a dance that they were doing to a particular music, and right. they were contacted by the composer to say, okay. I'm sorry, you can't use that music unless you pay for it. Right. But um, what some persons have, have done is that one, they have gifted their music okay. to um, the company. Okay. So, for instance, when we, ha when we did our work last year, by, um, we had asked 
a courier from the Ailey company to come and she, Hope Boykin and she had brought an original composition of her music which she had got the rights to use right. from the composer okay. and it was gifted to us Okay, and so that work can be performed repeatedly locally okay. and overseas because we have been you, given you have the, the right you have right. been given the right okay but okay. it's a concern though because um, you know there's a lot of um, attention being given to intellectual property yes, yeah, yes. you know um, recognizing the artist paying the artist for his work right. his or her work and, and giving the artist their due and so there has been concern over you know do we have the rights to use it and yes. how long do we have it for exactly and everybody's becoming more savvy in terms of adhering to what the rules and guidelines are in terms right. of use of other people's work yeah, and the, I mean the world again because of social media the, work, the world is just getting much smaller so much smaller so the minute you, you post a clip it's like oh that's mine yes <laughs> yes 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 yeah. you know and it's all about the different persons who come together to create something when you look at the dance and you're looking at recognizing the costume designer yes the person who, dis- who constructed the costume yes you look at the lighting designer mm-hmm. You're looking at the music, who arranged, who composed, yes. and who performed. Yes, yes. You're looking at the dancers because yes. they have to be recognized. Who choreographed and who oh, exactly. who's dancing. Exactly. Yeah. So there are all and these... sometimes projectionists and... Thank you. And props. And, yeah. okay. So there are different... All these different elements that come to the creator work that everybody must be given the respect they deserve. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. absolutely. So by the time we look at the program now, you see all credits running on the entire page <laughs> before True. you get to the other but work. But hey, if that's what you need to do, then that's what you need that's to do. That's what you need to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, Marlon, I think I'm sure I'm going to talk to you again at some point. But but this was wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for thank you, thank you. And look at you—you you say you didn't even want to talk. Yeah, how I, wonderful this was. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you you did, you did let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. So, no, thank you. I really appreciate it. And you were a wonderful host. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. Don't forget, rate, drop a review, share, like, you know, spread the word. I would really appreciate it. Till next time.